Call. Pied Piper Retold. A Tale in the Romance, a medieval fairy tale series. Written by Demelza Carlton. Auto narrated by AI Charlotte from Google. 1. Another one full. Sarah said, carefully tipping the contents of her apron into the sack. The peeled chestnuts cascaded dutifully down onto their fellows, before Sarah tied off the top of the sack, so she could carry it to the cart. The chestnut harvest had been good this year, and they'd have plenty of flour to see them through till spring. Once these had been milled of course. How do you peel them so fast? Silvana said, staring at her half-full basket. She stabbed her knife into a shell and the nut jumped out, surprising her. Practice and knowing which ones are ready and which need more time, Sara answered. She seized her empty basket and headed up to the smokehouse. She breathed deeply as she ascended the stairs to the upper level, where the racks of sweet-smelling chestnuts dried over the smoke from their smoldering shells on the level below. It took her right back to her childhood, when her grandfather had first brought her in here. She'd had to stretch up onto her toes to see the rows of round nuts lined up on the racks, and the one that burst open before her eyes. She'd squealed at the glimpse of creamy gold flesh amid all that brown, and her grandfather had helped her peel the nut and take it home. If she'd known then that she'd inherit the smokehouse, along with all the rest of her family's holdings, when sickness had carried away her parents and all her siblings in one horrible summer, and she'd struggled through her first autumn harvest alone, she might have been less excited about that first visit. But grief no longer stabbed at her heart as it had all those years ago, and she'd spent every harvest since shelling nuts with Tola and Maria, Silvana's mother, until one cold winter's night, when the reaper had called for Maria, too. If only she had a daughter who would take her place at the table with Silvana, and Tola's daughter Swanhild, when she was gone. Though the way fate had shaped her life so far, Sara herself would probably teach Silvana and Swanhild's daughters to shell the nuts, her fingers as gnarled as the chestnut kernels themselves. Sara shook herself. Such thoughts were silly. She had no need of a daughter, she had a fine son. Tobias would be a man soon enough, ready to marry and have children of his own. If only his father had lived long enough to see him. Were those tears on her cheeks? Surely not. It was perspiration from the heat in here. She should fill her basket quickly and head back outside. By the time she reached the cooler air outside, Silvana had emptied her basket, and was headed into the smokehouse for a refill. Can you teach me to choose the right ones? Both you and Tola work so much faster than me. I'll never be good enough. Silvana's eyes brimmed with tears. Sara pried the basket from the girl's hands. Your mother was always the slowest of the three of us when it came to peeling the nuts, but she was the best at pressing them. Here, take my basket and put them in the pressing barrel. I'll fill yours for you. Really? Sara gave a nod, and the girl hastened back to the table where Tola still sat. The morning passed quickly, until the cart could hold no more. Silvana might have spent more time stamping on the nuts in the pressing barrel than picking or peeling them, but Sara didn't mind. She'd done her fair share of dancing in the pressing barrel when she was a girl. Now her feet would hurt by day's end if she did Silvana's job. Will you join us for the midday meal? Sara asked Silvana. The girl shook her head, furrowing her brow. I'll take the cart down to father at the mill. I must make sure he has his dinner, she said. Sara nodded. Rigolo had not taken his wife's death well, and if he didn't have Silvana still, he might have followed Maria into the grave. Best the girl get home and give him some work to do. So Sara helped Silvana harness the pony to take the cart to the mill, where Silvana and her father would turn the shelled nuts into flour, to be bagged and distributed as Sara directed. Her family might own the chestnut orchards and the smokehouse, along with all the land around, but Sara made sure those who helped with the harvest received their share of the final product, to feed them through the winter. Even Silvana and her father, who took a tithe of what went through the mill. Her family had once owned the mill too, 
but some wise ancestor had bequeathed the orchards to one brother and the mill to another, which made Silvana and her father some sort of distant cousin to Sara, several times removed. What's in the pot? Tola asked, bringing Sarah's thoughts back to her own home. Sara grinned. I hope you're not sick of chestnuts. I popped some in the pot, along with the peas I shelled this morning and the last of the bacon. It should have thickened nicely by now. Perfect with some bread. Tola's eyebrows rose. You're out of bacon already? Tobias eats enough for three men, though he's still a boy. He'll have to do without for a few weeks. As soon as we've cleared the smokehouse, Cronus will slaughter some pigs for me and hang them up to smoke. They're fattening up in the forest on fallen chestnuts as we speak. Whereas Swanhild eats like a bird. I'd fear for her health if she didn't spend most days in the forest, harvesting herbs. There's food aplenty for those that know how to find it, and she must. Tola shook her head, then sniffed deeply. Oh, it is definitely time to eat. They took their bowls outside to the table where they'd been shelling nuts, sitting in the last of the sun, before the mountain shadows stole it from them. But until it did, they enjoyed the view over the lake that lay beside the town. Today, the still surface mirrored the blue sky, illustrating perfectly why the town had earned its name of Miroton. Mercurio is early, Tola remarked. Sara sopped up the last of her stew with a crust of bread. He's not due for weeks and it looks too big to be his boat, are you sure? Tola pointed, and Sara could not deny that the ship cutting its way across the lake bore Mercurio's brightly colored sail. Profits must be good if he has bought a bigger boat. Both women rose. I'd best get home and see what I have to trade. He'll have some rare ingredients from the traders in Rialto, which I've been waiting for, Tola said. They said their farewells while Sara gathered up the dishes, but Sara lingered outside for a moment. Mercurio the merchant, sailing his boat up and down the river and through the mysterious marshes to the port of Rialto, always brought new and intriguing things from faraway lands. For a price, of course. What treasures would his ship hold this time? A chill breeze swept down from the mountain as the sun slipped behind a cloud. Sara shivered and hurried inside. 2. Run girl run. Zotikus watched the girl's expression change from panic to determined clarity. Her arms flew out like wings, letting go of everything she possessed. Before her things thudded to the ground, Melisande took flight. He'd seen the sequence a dozen times in his visions of this moment, but somehow the addition of sound made it more real. The scrunch of sand beneath her boots as she broke into a run, audible even over the distant screams of battle on the other side of the field. Clad in only her tunic and hose, Melisande moved so swiftly the cloth was plastered against the curves of her blatantly female body. Eager shouts and the thunder of hooves heralded her pursuit, invisible in the crowd of panicked crusaders. Zotikus unslung his bow and reached for his first arrow. He sighted along it, then waited. Four riders emerged from the melee, whipping their horses hard in their frenzy for the hunt. The hunters did not know they would be the prey today. Sir Engerant led the charge, a black raven atop a stolen white horse. Sir Giscard followed some distance behind, his horse unable to keep up with the fleet-footed mare. Sir Enfoy was hot on his heels, with Sir Roland bringing up the rear on a horse that could scarcely bear his weight. Zotikus could not abide a man who abused his mount. He lined up his shot, and Roland fell first, rolling on the ground while his relieved horse rode on without him. Onfoy had chosen to wear armor today, so Zotikus had to choose his target. Ah, there it was, when Onfoy leaned forward over his horse's neck, his breastplate rode up, exposing far more of his side than was safe with archers about. A kidney shot, followed by a second arrow that lodged firmly in the man's left buttock. He too went tumbling from the saddle, but unlike Roland, Onfoy's foot caught in the stirrup, and his horse dragged him along the ground, likely doing even more damage. Giscard had not bothered to don his armor, so the owl on his tunic was clear to see. 
Zodocus aimed for above the owl though, and his aim was true. The first arrow caught him in the back of the neck, sinking in deep. Engerant rode alone, heedless of the loss of his companions, intent only on catching the girl. A girl whose head whipped back for scarcely a moment. Had she seen the glint of the knight's teeth, bared in a triumphant grin? Or was it her brother's horse that had made her smile before a puff of magic surrounded her, and she vanished? Magic spirited her across the field and into the trees, faster than any horse could gallop, but Engerant could not see it. Instead, he reined in his horse, casting about for the treasure he'd lost. Only then did he realize he was alone, his men having fallen along the way. In the space of a moment, Engerin seemed to regain his senses, and he fixed his sights on Zotacus. With the girl gone, he set his horse against a different target. Zotacus stood his ground. He'd seen this in his vision too, and he knew how it would end. He waited until he could see the horse's eyes, mad at this mistreatment from a man who was not her master. No. Halt Pegasus. Zotacus called, and the obedient mare skidded to a stop. But Engerant did not, flying over the horse's head and over Zotacus, to land awkwardly on the stony ground. The knight struggled to draw his sword, but he'd broken both arms in his fall. Help me and my father will richly reward you, the man begged. Zotacus leaned down and pulled Engerin's sword from its scabbard. It was a fine weapon, far finer than the man it had been made for. The knight would need neither sword nor scabbard now, so Zotacus unfastened the man's baldric. More broken bones moved beneath his hand, Engerin had shattered several ribs too, and at least one had punctured his lungs. Mercy, cried the knight. He tried to lift his arm to shield himself, but his strength had already started to fade. Zotacus considered the shattered man at his feet. Mercy came in many forms. A magical healer might make the knight whole again, but without swift aid he would certainly die, and die in agony. Did you offer Babette mercy? Or any of the other girls you hunted and killed like animals? Zotacus asked, sliding the sword back into its scabbard before tucking both into his bag. Who? The knight asked. Did you know any of the girls' names? No. How about Sir Joss, who you cut down with this very blade, so that you might force yourself upon his sister? Zotacus persisted. He'd heard of men who repented their crimes when faced with death, but he had yet to meet one. Most of the men Zotacus had killed preferred to spit curses with their final breath. It seemed Engerand would not be such a man, either. Help, the knight moaned, trying to crawl away. Zotacus decided to leave Engerand until last, and check on the others. Giscard stared sightlessly up at the sky, a broken arrow protruding from his throat. It had gone all the way through, as if shot from a crossbow and not a longbow. A formidable weapon indeed, no wonder the Seljuk archers were so fearsome, armed with these. Zotacus would keep his Seljuk longbow, lest it be useful later. Onfois's corpse was not so serene. His horse had grown weary of dragging it, and crushed the offending weight beneath his hooves. The result was that where the knight's head had once been was now a piece of pulped meat. Roland had not been as lucky. Thrown free from his horse, his roll along the ground had torn the arrows out of his flesh, leaving gaping wounds through which his organs spilled. Much like Engerand, Roland's injuries were definitely mortal. Four men dead, or they would be by the end of the day. And every man who'd marched with them, thanks to the Seljuk army and the ambush, no one but Zotacus had suspected. He could head home and collect payment for a job well done. Ah, but he owed it to Joss to bring proof to the man's grave that his sister's violators were no more. So Zotacus collected three more swords and three signet rings, before heading back to the moaning, groaning worm that was Engerand. He found Pegasus prancing around the man, shaking her head at him. It wasn't until Zotacus got closer, that he realized the wretch had managed to wrap his hand around a rope trailing from the mare's bridle, and she was attempting to break free. Easy Pegasus, he said, holding up his hands. 
He'd seen Godfrey manage this horse all the way to Bizzers, and she'd seemed a biddable enough beast then. No. If you'll just let me get close enough, I'll free you, and we can be on our way. I'll take you home to Godfrey and all your other stablemates, Zotacus continued. This was apparently not to Pegasus's taste, for she reared up onto her hind legs, then brought her front hooves down hard. Engirin's brain splattered on Zotacus's boots. Pegasus tossed her head, pulling the reins from Engirin's slackened grasp as she stepped back from the corpse she'd created. Zotacus pulled the ornate raven ring from Engerin's hand and stuffed that into his sack with everything else. Now, would you like me to take you home, or are you planning on joining the Seljuk army? He asked the horse. It was a good thing horses were not susceptible to the plague, or she never would have made it home, Zotacus thought. Nor had she liked the ship, but... He blinked. A low wooden ceiling floated above, while straw rustled beneath him when he moved. Everything ached like Pegasus had stomped on his whole body. But he'd returned Pegasus to Godfrey long ago, before placing his sword and signet ring collection on Joss's grave. In fact, the last time he'd felt so weak, he'd been aboard that rat-infested ship, fighting off that benighted plague that had killed off more crusaders than the Seljuks had. Zotacus groaned. Not again. A pestilence on all plagues, for he was heartily sick of them. 3. When Tobias left to take the goats up to the high pasture the next morning, Mercurio's stall was already under construction. Not that Mercurio himself was doing the work, oh no, he had every labourer in town fetching and carrying for him, earning credit they might spend on his goods. Sarah's brother-in-law Ahab would be among them, likely setting up the stall and directing everyone else, for it would not do for the head of the town council to be seen doing the work of a common labourer. She shaded her eyes and peered at the hive of activity on the lake shore. Ah good, Mercurio had brought the winter fodder for the town. They'd had a warm, dry summer up in the mountains, but you could never tell if the lowlands had had similarly good haymaking weather, until the hay arrived. In her grandfather's time, the hay they made in the high pastures had seen the village livestock through most winters, but the goat herd had grown since then, even more so with Ahab on the council. He'd helped the town prosper, and it had surely grown, so they could sell their surplus downriver, but they'd also had to buy in more things they simply didn't have. Without trade, Miroton would face a hard winter. But not this winter. Judging by the parade of bundles coming out of the ship's hold, the haste beside the town green would be full to the rafters. A good thing, for the harvest from the high pastures had barely filled her own hayloft this year. Part of her wanted to go down there and see what Mercurio had to sell, but she still had chestnuts to shell, so she fetched a basket and sat down at the table where she might watch the impromptu market while she worked. Mercurio's first customer was Tola, carrying two big baskets of herbs to sell. They took their time, bargaining over each item, until Tola looked satisfied. Only then did Tola deign to look at Mercurio's wares, carefully selecting perhaps half a basket's worth of things before any coins changed hands. Sara smiled. No wonder Mercurio appeared to be sweating, Tola was the one taking the money, not him. Most people didn't know she'd grown up in Rialto before coming to Miroton, newly widowed, and she'd learned to bargain from the best. The next customer was Ahab and his daughter Isabel. Sarah was surprised to see the girl, for when she'd asked Ahab if Isabel could help shell nuts, he'd said she was too ill to leave the house. If she'd recovered, Sarah should ask again. She set down her basket and headed down the hill to the lake. On her way she met Father Fazio, the town priest, carrying a large cloth-draped bundle. Are you selling things to Mercurio too, Father? Sarah asked. Fazio laughed. No, Mistress Sarah. All I have belongs to Mother Church, what would I have to sell? But Mercurio carries goods and messages from my bishop in Rialto, and he is kind enough to transport our messenger birds back. He lifted the cloth to reveal a cage full of pigeons. Sarah blinked. I thought the point of messenger birds was that they could fly and carry messages on their own. 
Wouldn't that be faster than sending them by boat? Fazio's eyes widened before he laughed again. Oh yes of course but messenger birds only fly home. You cannot train them to fly back and forth, wherever you please. So these birds are Miroton pigeons born and raised here. Mercurio will take them to the bishop, who can then send me messages by releasing these pigeons. Ingenious, no? Sarah had to agree. Before she could say so, however, little Bernard ran up to the priest to breathlessly ask for him to come and help his grandfather. Fazio promised to speak to Sarah more later, and headed off with the boy. Mistress Sarah, you grow more beautiful with each season that passes. She arched her eyebrows. And your flattery, Master Mercurio, rings even more hollow than last time. He looked hurt. Mayhap you cannot see it, but I only speak the truth. Come Ahab, is Sarah not the most beautiful woman alive? Beautiful but heartless I fear. I have asked her many a time to marry me but she still mourns my brother and will until her dying breath, Ahab replied. At least that's what she told Ahab. Heartless indeed, Mercurio said smoothly. Any other town along the mighty river I might find a guest bed in the best house, but Mistress Sarah would rather I sleep aboard my cold boat than beneath her roof. His eyes glittered, daring her to defend herself. But to do so, she'd have to admit she'd taken Mercurio as her lover, after her husband had died, and he'd likely be her lover still if she hadn't seen him with a maiden in one of the other villages downriver. Well, the girl had been a maiden until she'd succumbed to the trader's flattery. Sarah had no intention of lying with a man who had a mistress in every hamlet he docked at. I think only of the virtue of the girls in our town. Your reputation as a seducer of women precedes you, as always, Mercurio. Sarah smiled sweetly. Ahab's eyes grew huge. Come, Isabel, we should get started on those mattresses. Even with straw this fresh, they will not stuff themselves. He tugged on his daughter's arm to hurry her back up the hill to town. Sarah almost laughed. Ahab had his shortcomings, but he was absolutely devoted to the protection of his only daughter. Speaking of which, Isabel, I still have chestnuts left to shell. If you have time to help, I can promise you a bag of chestnut flour for the trouble, Sarah said. Isabel turned. I thank you for the offer, Aunt Sarah, but I must do the mattresses. Maybe when they are finished. Sarah nodded. The offer is open until all the nuts are done. At least another week. Isabel nodded her thanks, then hurried off in her father's wake. What do you have to trade, Mistress Sarah? I have much that might interest you. Fine silks from across the sea, candles from the holy land you might burn in church to pray for your husband's soul. In fact, I have been fortunate enough to acquire an entire cargo of items from the holy land and bizzes. If you ever chose to wear anything but mourning clothes, you might like. Mercurio flung open a chest, then lifted up a swathe of gossamer thin fabric that shimmered in the sunlight. The sunlight seemed to shine right through the bright stripes too. The finest silk from the far east. You would look divine draped in a dress made of this. I'd look like a concubine from someone's harem more like, Sarah said. She shook her head. Maybe next time you come to Miroton, Mercurio. The miller has barely begun grinding this year's crop of chestnuts, so I cannot say if we will have any surplus to sell this year. It will still be another week before I'm done shelling them, the harvest was so good. After that, I'd hope to start on the cheeses, though I'm down a dairy hand since Santina died. No one else can work that kind of magic with milk. Sadly, Santina had not managed to teach her cheesemaking skills to her daughter Isabel. They'd both fallen ill of the same summer fever, and only young Isabel had survived, though she'd been delicate ever since. Mercurio pressed both hands to his chest. Ark, but you are heartless indeed, Mistress Sarah. Not only do you deny me your warm hospitality, but I do not even have one of your glorious cheeses to sweeten my supper. Her cheeses were salty, not sweet at all, but Sarah chose not to correct him. 
Instead, she said, perhaps you should try to sell some of your holy candles or other things to Father Fazio, who has some pigeons for you. Perhaps next time you will feel more kindly disposed toward me, Mistress Sara, Mercurio said. She couldn't suppress her smile. Perhaps. It will depend on how good a price you give me for my cheeses. Mercurio bowed deeply. Mistress Sara, I have always given you my best, and I always will. No. No matter how good a lover he'd been, she had no intention of allowing him to share her bed again. See you next time, Mercurio. She turned on her heel and headed back up the hill. 4. Peace, brother. I mean you no harm. Zotacus blinked, his bleary eyes focusing on the blade he held at the stranger's throat. The religious brother's throat, judging by the man's tonsured head. Zotacus sheathed his knife. Forgive me, brother. What with your dark robes and all, I mistook you for death, come to claim me. The monk managed a sad smile. I suspect death fears you more than you fear him, for he took everyone else in the village, yet you are still here. You mean the plague killed them? The monk bowed his head. They no longer suffer, yet by some miracle you have been saved. I must take you to see the abbot. Zotacus considered arguing, but this abbot would likely know more than some lowly monk. May I have a moment to make myself presentable then? He asked instead. The monk smiled. Of course. Take all the time you need. I must see if there are any other survivors in the inn. Zotacus chose not to extinguish the hope in the man's eyes with more truth. Now if he were traveling with Melisande still, the crusader girl with a magical gift for swiftness, he would have made some wry remark that would make the girl's eyes grow round, the better to drink in all the strange sights as they traveled. But she was a girl no longer, traveling only occasionally with her husband, for they had several children now. And her brother, the brave but foolish Sir Godfrey, ah, it did not do to dwell on the past. Particularly when in the present, he needed to take a piss. That taken care of, he found a fresh tunic and hose, but what he really wanted was a wash. Heaven only knew how many days he'd lain abed, fighting the plague. Something to ask the abbot. What little water remaining in the ewer did not look fresh, so he headed out to the inn yard in search of a well. He found a horse trough, the water murkier than the bottom of the jug in his room, and shuddered. The well, when he did find it, was tucked behind the stables, beside the inn's kitchen gardens. Even in the warmth of a summer afternoon, the water felt shockingly cold against his skin. The vision hit him without warning. The bite of cold air on his cheeks, as a woman dashed across a castle bailey, her heavy cloak flying out behind her like a raven's wings. Her ruddy lips parted as if to speak, urgency darkening her eyes. Zotacus blinked, and the vision was gone. He knew neither the woman nor her castle, but one day he would stand in that very bailey, witness to the lady's flight. That's how his visions worked. Several minutes later, washed and dressed in clean garb, he strode out into the town square. Monks carried cloth-wrapped bundles to a cart, before heading back into the cottages where the townspeople had once lived. A small arm slipped from its wrapping, and Zodicus's blood ran cold. The bundles were all bodies, being taken to the churchyard for burial. You should not be here, good sir, if you value your life. Please I beg you, turn back the way you have come, lest this accursed pestilence take you too. Zotacus spun to face a panicked priest, who seemed to think making shooing motions with his hands would make Zotacus disappear. Death didn't want me. One of the monks woke me. I was sleeping in that inn over there. Zotacus pointed. The priest's eyes widened. He fell to his knees, lifting his face to the sky. Heavens be praised. A miracle, just as the abbot predicted. He fastened his hands on Zodicus's arm. Sir, you must accompany us back to the cloister of the Holy Innocents. God himself has saved you, as the abbot saw in his vision, and you must come. Zotacus gently pried his arm free. 
You're mistaken, Father. There's nothing holy or miraculous about me. Just a matter of luck is all. Luck and magic, but he didn't think this pious priest would want to hear that. This isn't the first plague I've caught. I went on a crusade once, and our whole ship got sick on the way home. Death doesn't like me is all. Twice saved from the plague, dot you must be a holy man indeed sir. I beg you. A flash of color caught Zodicus's eye, and he ignored the priest so he might cross the square to see what it was. One of the bodies had been wrapped in a brightly striped cloak, the sort he'd seen sold in the marketplace in Bizzes. The sort crusaders had bought as gifts to take home for sisters, wives and daughters who would never receive them. Melisande had bought a sack made of the striped stuff, and he'd teased her mercilessly about it. She'd stubbornly hung onto it, until the day of his vision, when those four dishonored knights had died by his hand. But the cloak, crusaders had bought every one in the marketplace, until there was no striped cloth left in the whole city. And those who had survived to head home had fallen at the last in the plague ships, their belongings stored in the holds of those doomed vessels. Ship Zoticus had told Duke Sebastiano to burn, with everything they contained. Surely the man hadn't been foolish enough to take the infected goods and offer them for sale. But the Duke was a merchant of Rialto. Commerce ran as readily as blood through the veins of a man of Rialto. Zoticus should have burned the ships with his own hands. Doused them in oil then thrown a torch in after. But surely the plague could not persist for more than a decade. He might not be as skilled a healer as his mother or Melisande, but he knew enough about his family's history to be sure. Later, when he was alone, he would sift through the magical memories of his ancestors, to see what else they knew of plagues that might tell him how this could happen. Yet the cloak wrapped around yet another plague victim shone bright with accusation. He needed to know how a dead crusader's cloak came to be here of all places, at the same time as a plague slaughtered the town. Will you come to the cloister? the priest asked. His eyes shone with a kind of fervent faith Zotikas could only envy, for he had never known such a feeling to dwell within his own breast. It is a most holy place, with relics from the holy innocence preserved beneath the altar. I have no doubt it is God's call that woke you from your deathly sleep, calling you to undertake a pilgrimage, sir, to thank God for the miracle of your deliverance. Zotikas blinked. Once again, he found himself unwilling to destroy another man's hope. Perhaps, father. But first, I must head for Rialto. I have pressing business there, which cannot wait.